the soil and water that occurs in agricultural fields. They work to identify and implement practices that minimize erosion and nutrient losses while helping to re reduce the potential impacts on the environment. She's currently working on her PhD in plant and soil science. And uh, her topic today uh, okay, is uh, water runoff, surface runoff and tile drainage on dairy farms in the Lake Champlain area, but obviously applies to here since we have a very large, over 50% of our watershed is in agricultural property. So take it away, uh, Dana, or rather, Laura. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me all right? Uh, yes, ma'am. And uh, hopefully you're seeing the full screen rather than the presentation view? Correct. Okay, great. Um, all right. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me to uh, be here today. Uh, to start out, I'd just like to uh, give a bit of background on Minor Institute. Uh, we're just about uh, as northeast in New York as you can get in Shazy, New York, right along Lake Champlain uh, and just a few miles south of Canada. Uh, as researchers, we're, uh, we're really lucky to be able to work alongside the Institute's dairy farm, uh, which has a herd of just under 500 milking cows, uh, nearly 1,500 acres of cropland. Uh, that is managed for uh, hay crop silage and corn silage to feed our dairy herd. Uh, the farm faces uh, a lot of the same logistical challenges that any working farm does, uh, so it really helps keep our research relevant to the larger farming community. Uh, most of the data I'll present today uh, does come from projects on minor fields, but we do have some collaboration with uh, other local farms. So since I don't have a lot of time uh, here with you today, um, I just want to get straight to the results. So I won't be talking about how we collect our data, uh, but I can answer some questions at the end. Um, I do have some additional slides with some pictures, uh, if that's of interest during the Q&A, um, or please contact me and I can provide some more uh, detailed information. Uh, I also have some reports that go into more detail on individual projects that I'd be happy to share. Uh, so if you just want to shoot me an email if you're interested, I can, I can direct those your way. Uh, but suffice to say for now, uh, all of our water samples are collected uh, continuously year round. Uh, they're automatically collected based on the amount of flow. So when flow rates are high, uh, we're sampling more frequently. And when flow rates are low, uh, less frequently. Um, so say during a 24 hour, lar uh, 24 hour runoff event, uh, we could be sampling as frequently as every 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, which uh, helps ensure that we're able to capture all of the variability during an event. Uh, these samples are combined into one sample over the course of an event. Uh, and when we analyze that sample, it'll give us the average water quality over the course of that event uh, for whatever location we're sampling. Uh, and today, rather than focusing on any one project or practice um, that we're investigating individually, uh, to get a broader sense of what the water quality uh, is looking like across a range of fields and years, um, with, with some variation in the management. Uh, I've compiled data uh, across all of our projects from the past five years or so. Uh, so to get into the data now, um, here we're looking at a compilation of sample concentration data uh, from 2016 to 2020. Uh, we're looking at the results of 240 surface runoff samples and 1,102 tile drainage samples, uh, with each sample typically representing about a one to four day period. Uh, the samples come from six different cornfields uh, and represent five full years of continuous monitoring for two of the fields, uh, three years uh, for two other fields, and then two years for the remaining two fields. So, uh, you know, a, a lot of a lot of years of data uh, just in these in these graphs. Uh, all of these fields do receive manure applications each year and are tilled to incorporate that manure, um, and then tilled uh, again in the spring to prepare the soil for planting. Uh, the data we're looking at here are the concentrations of soluble reactive phosphorus and total phosphorus in surface runoff and tile drain in the surface runoff and tile drainage samples. Uh, on the left-hand graph, we're looking at uh, the soluble reactive P or SRP, um, and on the right, we're looking at total P. So SRP is an important form of phosphorus because it's the form that's uh, going to be immediately available either for our growing crops. Um, or for, um, you know, in the lakes, uh, it is the form that uh, those algal blooms can immediately uptake. Uh, we look at total phosphorus because it, uh, it's re representing the amount of phosphorus that is currently available, uh, but could also eventually become available in the future. 
So these graphs, uh, these types of graphs are uh, called box and whisker plots. Uh, we commonly use them to summarize large data sets. Uh, but so I'll walk us through uh, one graph to explain what we're looking at. Uh, the total P concentrations of surface runoff here is the clearest example uh, because it has the largest amount of uh, variability between the uh, different sample concentrations. Uh, but so if we look here at the uh, first line where uh, the arrow is pointing at, uh, we're looking at the 25th percentile. So in other words, 25% of the sample concentrations uh, that were measured are going to fall below that line. Uh, if you look at the associated table in the top left of the graph, uh, you can see that the value is 0 0.081 milligrams per liter. Uh, next, we have the 50th percentile in the middle, followed by the third line here, which is the 75th percentile. Uh, and you can also see those uh, values in the table along with the minimum and maximum sample concentrations. Uh, then based on these percentiles, uh, the lines that extend above and uh, below the 75th and 25th percentile lines uh, are going to show the maximum range of where we would expect the majority of sample concentrations to be found. Uh, and then all concentrations outside of that range are considered to be outliers. Uh, so using these types of graphs, we can see the most common values of our sample concentrations. Uh, obviously, the uh, remaining three groupings of data, it's hard to see the percentile lines we just looked at uh, because they're so, so low in the range and there's uh, not a lot of variability within that low range. But uh, that's why I've included the, the tables so we can start to pull apart some of the differences. Uh, starting on the uh, all the way to the left, we can see the SRP concentrations. Um, and so we can see that uh, while 75% of the tile drainage concentrations are less than 0 0.006 milligrams per liter, only 25% of the surface runoff samples are less than uh, similar 0 0.005 milligrams per liter. Uh, and then looking at the outliers, we can see that the outlier samples for surface runoff are two to three uh, excuse me, times higher than the tiles uh, with only one sample here uh, for the tiles at about one milligrams per liter. Um, uh, we do see a similar story with total phosphorus concentrations with 28 outliers for surface runoff above milligrams per liter, uh, while for the tiles there are only five uh, that are at or above that one milligram per liter range. Um, and remember for the tile drainage, um, we're looking at uh, about 1,100 samples uh, compared to just 240 for the surface runoff. Uh, but paying attention to these outliers is extremely important uh, because the majority of losses uh, during the year typically come from just a few runoff events. Uh, and those, those losses are, are generally going to be driven by these outlier concentrations. So if we look at the percentile tables for total phosphorus, 50% uh, of the uh, tile samples are below 0.012 milligrams per liter, 75% uh, are below 0.032. Uh, then, so to put this in some context, um, as John mentioned earlier, the DEC classifies lakes uh, as impaired due to uh, total phosphorus when the concentrations uh, exceed 0.02 milligrams per liter. Uh, so we can see that 50% of the tile drainage samples are below that, uh, are, are definitely well below that level. Um, recognizing that there will be some dilution of the drainage waters, the EPA recommends that drainage waters not exceed 0.1 milligrams per liter. Um, so we can see that 25% at the 25th percentile uh, of those surface runoff concentrations uh, were exceeding the um, P impairment threshold by four times and are already close to that uh, 0.1 milligram per liter guideline. Uh, and at the 50th percentile, um, we're virtually two times greater than that. Um, so from a, from a concentration standpoint, um, the tile drainage waters are definitely of a, of a much higher quality with regards to P uh, than that surface runoff. Um, you know, if you, you may be thinking, uh, you know, we must have more tile flow um, then surface runoff, since we have about five times more samples uh, from the tiles than from the surface runoff, uh, and you'd be absolutely right. Uh, and so combining these concentrations with the amount of flow that they represent uh, is, is definitely necessary in order to estimate how much actual phosphorus we're losing from these fields. Uh, which uh, brings us to our next graph here, uh, where we're looking at the pounds of SRP per acre per year that were lost from each of the monitored fields. Uh, so along the bottom of the graph, uh, you can see the fields that we've monitored over the past five years. 
uh, with the amount of SRP lost per year uh, from each field uh, shown with each column. So the total amount of SRP lost during the year is represented by the height of the column and the total pounds per acre is shown above each column. Uh, the portion of the column that has the light green hatch marks uh, represents the amount lost in tile drainage, uh, with the remaining solid portion representing the amount lost in surface runoff. Uh, so uh, looking here at field I, we can see uh, we lost a total of 0.59 pounds per acre. Uh, that patterned portion uh, ends at about 0.2 pounds per acre. And so the remaining uh, about 0.4 pounds per acre in solid green uh, is, what, is what came from surface runoff. Uh, so there's obviously a wide range in the amount of exported SRP, um, ranging from about uh, 0.01 pounds per acre up to 1.1 pounds per acre. Uh, some of this is due to different, excuse me, some of this is due to differences between the fields. Uh, we can see a lot of variation um, for the same field across years, largely due to variations in the weather. Um, so looking at five years of losses from field C, uh, we can see a minimum of 0.01 pounds per acre in two different years, uh, but then we have two other years with 0.34 and 0.41 pounds per acre. Uh, but the common theme you can see uh, across the majority of the data is that the largest portions are from surface runoff. Um, we do have some years where there's so little surface runoff that the only losses are going to come from tile drainage, uh, but of all the years with the larger scale losses, you know, only one time are we seeing those losses being driven by tile drainage. So overall, across uh, all these years and fields, uh, we see an average SRP loss of 0.21 pounds per acre per year, uh, with two thirds of that coming from surface runoff. Um, and despite the fact that tile drainage uh, accounts for roughly uh, three quarters of total drainage, um, it can be anywhere from 50% to 100%, but generally somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of an average uh, across years of 75%. Um, the, uh, the much lower concentrations in the tile water um, are still able to comp compensate um, for that elevated flow rate. Uh, I don't have time to go through individual project results here, uh, but of the few years of monitoring in projects that um, have directly compared tiled versus untiled fields, uh, we've either seen no significant change in the amount of SRP lost or a, actually a modest reduction in SRP loading from those tiled locations. So here we're looking at the exact same type of graph, uh, but just looking at total P losses instead of SRP. Uh, so we see pretty much all the same trends here that we saw with SRP just on a larger scale, uh, because on average, SRP was about 50% of the total phosphorus. Um, and uh, we, with about uh, 0.4 pounds per acre per year of total P lost, uh, two thirds of that is coming from the surface runoff, again, just as we saw with SRP. So taking again a closer look at field C, uh, we again see a, a nice wide range uh, from a low of 0.05 pounds per acre in 2018, uh, up to 10 times that in 2019. Um, and again, looking at that high loss field here, field H, uh, we see by far the worst year um, with one and a half pounds per acre of total P lost. Uh, but then we do see in the following year that drops down to uh, 0.35 pounds per acre. So, uh, well, the Total P loss from field H is more than three times the average. Um, in this case, um, knowing what you know, knowing what we do about the field, it's also not totally surprising, um, given what we know to be risk factors for uh, P loss in general from from fields. Uh, this field does really check a lot of those boxes. Uh, then, with some uh, some uh, really unfortunate weather um, tied uh, thrown in for good measure in 2019. Um, so this field is directly behind the barn and manure storage area. Uh, so it has a long history of manure application, which has led to a buildup of phosphorus in the soil over the years uh, before, uh, you know, really uh, the modern nutrient management practices came into effect. Um, this is a common problem on many farms where the fields around the barns have historically gotten the most manure because they tend to be the oldest, they're the most convenient, um, and also of course require less fuel to get to. Uh, the soil in field H uh, is also a fine textured soil, so it uh, does have a tendency to develop those larger cracks and pores that can allow um, that drainage water to move from the surface um, through the subsurface, bypassing the, the natural fil filtration potential of the soil. Um, 
This means that uh, there is a higher possibility for uh, water high in phosphorus to move from the surface to the tiles very quickly when there's a runoff event shortly, uh, shortly following nutrient applications. Uh, the field is also very flat, um, so we do tend to see a higher percentage of tile drainage uh, from this field because uh, only during very, very large surface uh, runoff events do we see surface runoff. Um, then to amplify um, all of these risk factors uh, in 2019, uh, manure wasn't tilled into the soil the same day um, as it usually would be uh, due to a variety of reasons. Um, and then a few days later before uh, we could get it incorporated, uh, we got a very unexpected uh, and very early large snowstorm. Um, and then of course, uh, we got another one a couple weeks later. Um, and so then in two different periods of warm weather, uh, a few weeks later, we had two large runoff events. Uh, where we lost the entire snowpack. Um, and in just those two runoff events, uh, we saw 50, about 50% 50 of the total phosphorus losses from that field uh, during that year. Uh, but again, uh, looking at 2020, um, even with all of those same inherent risk factors, uh, just by getting that manure incorporated and sort of without that really poorly timed weather, um, we didn't see nearly the same scale of losses. So even though we obviously never want to see these, uh, uh, never want to see these types of elevated losses, uh, it does help confirm what we believe to be the most important factors controlling phosphorus loss from the fields, uh, and it lets us know that when we are doing the right things, uh, these types of losses are going to be rare. Um, and while this field isn't the only one on the farm that uh, does have some of these similar inherent characteristics, uh, it is definitely in the minority. Uh, so by including in this field in, uh, in our data set, uh, along with field I here, which you can see right next to it, um, which has some of the same risk factors, uh, I think it's giving us a good perspective of the losses at the, at the whole farm scale. Uh, and these averages we're looking at um, are likely a good representation of what's happening um, across the corn fields on the farm. So to give these numbers some perspective, um, if we consider each year an average corn silage crop removes about 30 to 40 pounds of phosphorus per acre from the soil, um, let's say on average we're applying enough manure to uh, just replace the phosphorus that is removed. Um, so if that has us dividing by our average annual total P loss of 0.39 pounds per acre uh, by an average application rate of 35 pounds per acre, uh, that means we're really, we're only losing about 1% of the phosphorus that we're applying each year. Uh, you know, now uh, in most cases, if you're going to say you're 99% efficient, uh, you know, probably going to be feeling pretty good about yourself. Um, you know, it's not to say, you know, job well done us, let's, let's call it a day. Uh, but it is important to recognize, uh, you know, that the work we, that has been done so far to improve nutrient use efficiency has actually done a really good job of, of turning down the faucet on these uh, phosphorus losses from the field. So uh, now it's just that last small drip uh, that we still really need to fix. Uh, obviously, that last little bit is also the hardest to get at. Um, so now that we've gotten to this point, the, the challenge is to figure out how to get that last 1% down even further. So keeping in mind the data that uh, we've just covered, um, I want to take a closer look at a runoff event uh, at a plot scale research site uh, here at Miner. Uh, before we get to the data, uh, just to give some quick background, um, this is a research site with four quarter acre plots uh, that were in corn during the study. Uh, two of the plots were tile drained um, and the other two weren't. Uh, we sampled the surface runoff from each of the four plots uh, and we sampled the tile drainage from the two tiled plots. Uh, if you look at the dates along the bottom, you can see most of the action is happening on Christmas. So obviously uh, we didn't have any corn growing uh, during this event. Um, we also didn't have a cover crop uh, and manure had been applied to the plots about one month before this event. So taking a look at the data now, uh, the points on each of the lines represent the average uh, mass of total P lost during one hour uh, in grams per acre uh, from each of these three runoff types. Uh, so at the top in red uh, are the losses from surface runoff from those untiled plots. Uh, then next in light green uh, are the losses from the tiles in the tiled plots. And then finally in dark green at the bottom are the phosphorus losses in surface runoff from those tile drained plots. 
So an important point, um, which you can't tell from this graph, is that there was 86% less surface runoff from the tiled plots uh, than from the untiled plots. Um, because as the snow melted, the increased drainage ability of those tiled plots uh, meant that a lot more water could infiltrate the soil uh, and move down to the tile lines. And so we really only saw a small amount of surface runoff from the tile drained plots during this event. Uh, even though there was uh, much less surface runoff, the tiled plots actually generated 67% more total runoff than the untiled plots. Uh, because of all of that subsurface drainage to the tile lines. So looking at the graph of phosphorus losses, uh, we can see that the highest rate of phosphorus loss happened in the surface runoff from the tiled plots, uh, that top line. Um, uh, we can see we only had a small amount of phosphorus loss uh, from the surface runoff in those tile drained plots. Uh, and so we, from those tile drained plots, we did see the majority moving through the tile lines. Um, but uh, overall, uh, we actually saw a 50% reduction in the phosphorus loss um, in those tile drained plots relative to the undrained plots. Uh, so we saw uh, 0.12 pounds per acre of phosphorus loss uh, from the undrained plots compared to 0.06 from the tile drained plots. Uh, so by allowing that same drainage water that was being lost from the surface um, in the undrained plots uh, to move through the tiles, uh, to move through the soil uh, before being drained by the tiles rather than, rather than directly um, off the surface, uh, we were able to reduce that amount of phosphorus uh, pretty significantly. Um, you know, so I'm not trying to say here that uh, tile drainage is actually the solution to all of our problems, but you know, we have actually seen similar results quite frequently across other studies and other fields uh, where uh, allowing that water to, to move through the subsurface can, um, can take advantage of the natural filtration capacity and, and pea removal capacity of the soil. Uh, so, you know, as we've seen, a lot of our highest rates of phosphorus loss um, have occurred in surface runoff. Um, this is often during snowmelt events um, in a lot of our fields, whether that's um, sort of midwinter or early winter uh, melt events or sort of the, the final loss of the snowpack uh, in the spring. Um, but so by, again, allowing uh, a much higher subsurface drainage uh, rate through those fields with tile drainage, um, we can um, often see reductions in the amount of, of phosphorus loss because uh, that some of that phosphorus in the, in the water uh, is being mitigated by, by the soils. So while this won't always be the case, uh, in many cases, um, you know, we, we have seen this to be true. Um, again, even though we're seeing substantially more water uh, being lost through those tile drains than what we see uh, being lost from the surface. So, um, you know, this isn't to say that tiles are going to be effective at reducing phosphorus loss in all cases, um, but it is common enough uh, that, you know, I think it's, it's important that we don't ignore this ability uh, while also still recognizing that we do know there are risk factors that need to be managed uh, or else we'll just, you know, end up losing out on some of those benefits we've gained um, and either be, you know, be back where we started or worse. Um, so we've had two projects that, that did uh, directly compare a tiled versus an untiled situation. One was this plot, plot scale project, uh, which went on for a little less than two years and another three year project that is currently ongoing uh, comparing two six acre fields. So while uh, results for both projects uh, have varied somewhat uh, between events and years, overall the average total P losses um, were virtually identical. So uh, you know we haven't seen an overall improvement uh, in those two projects with regard to P losses, but we also haven't seen any negative effects uh, with regard to P losses. Um, and at the same time, we were able to reap all of those agronomic benefits that that tiles can provide at the same time. Um, and some of those agronomic benefits can also lead to environmental benefits. Uh, when fields are better drained, um, it's going to effectively create a longer growing season. Um, and something that uh, can be overlooked is that by having this longer field season, uh, that provides farms more flexibility in when they're able to apply manure. 
Um, and so that means that they can't afford to stay off those fields in, in higher risk times. Um, rather than just being, you know, being forced by, you know, the, the impending calendar of the winter coming. And so, you know, manure needs to get applied. Um, you know, if, if there's if there's a longer period, corn's getting off the off the field sooner, they, they've got more time in that fall to get that manure out. Uh, tile drainage also can allow a higher yielding and higher quality crop, um, which allows farms to rely more on their own homegrown feeds. Uh, this means they don't have to import as many nutrients onto the farm, um, often coming from the Midwest. Uh, and when we're importing those nutrients from the Midwest, uh, you know, we're feeding our animals with them, then we're applying that manure to the soils. Uh, and so this imbalanced uh, nutrient budget can lead to uh, phosphorus buildup in our soil. So if we're able to rely more on homegrown feeds, uh, that's going to contribute to a, a, a more balanced nutrient budget uh, within our farms. Uh, and then again, with a longer growing season, uh, that's going to make uh, some conservation practices like cover crops more manageable. Uh, because again, uh, that corn's going to be planted earlier, it can be harvested earlier. So then that cover crop can get, uh, get planted uh, early enough in the fall um, to establish some growth, be able to really uh, meaningfully stabilize that soil, as well as remove nutrients from the soil before the cold weather hits. Um, and we see these uh, high runoff events uh, in the non-growing season. So wrapping up, uh, based on all the data we've collected so far, uh, we are seeing about two thirds of the phosphorus loss coming from surface runoff, about a third from tile drainage. Uh, we haven't seen any evidence yet of tile drainage increasing phosphorus losses. Um, and then if we are managing things well, in some cases, it even has the potential to reduce those phosphorus losses. Uh, by giving that the soil a chance to filter the, the phosphorus out of those drainage waters. Um, something I didn't really hit on today, but uh, one of the reasons surface runoff concentrations uh, tend to be higher is because they're carrying some level of eroded soil with it. Um, and so by allowing uh, more tile drainage, less surface runoff, we're going to see uh, sharp reductions in soil erosion. So uh, not just the phosphorus that those uh, sediments are carrying, but also just, um, you know, less sediment, less sediment moving through, moving through those uh, tributaries and ending up in the lakes. Uh, so the losses we're seeing in both surface runoff and tile drainage, again, just representing a very small fraction of what is being applied to the field. So, so most of what is being applied is being kept within those field boundaries. Uh, and those, those, those losses are coming uh, just really during a very short portion of the year. Um, typically just, you know, one to three runoff events um, are what we're seeing delivering the majority of the nutrients. Um, and our data so far has provided confirmation of the risk factors um, that previous research has identified, like, uh, you know, like the importance of getting that surface applied manure incorporated, uh, doing our best to put as much time in between nutrient applications and those high intensity runoff events as possible, uh, and preventing the buildup of excessive phosphorus levels in the soil, um, or where they're already there working, working to draw them back down. Uh, as far as tile specific risk factors, the, the heavier soils um, or no-till soils um, that are able to develop those, those large uh, pores that can help with drainage but can also be uh, a conduit for phosphorus loss. Uh, those soils can be less effective at mitigating the, the pee in the drainage water. Um, so figuring out how to best handle those types of soils is currently a work in progress. Um, but if we continue to address these factors, uh, these risk factors collectively, you know, I think we will be able to reduce these phosphorus losses even further. Um, so looking to continue, continue the progress uh, with nutrient management practices that we've already seen. Um, we currently have uh, a project in the early stages looking at the impacts of no-till corn, uh, as well as another project uh, that has just one more year of the six-year project looking uh, that's looking at the impacts of slowing the rate of tile drainage uh, outside of the growing season. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously frustrating not to be able to get faster answers than, you know, with, uh, you know, one six-year study at a time. Uh, but it is really critical to have these types of long-term projects uh, to be able to understand how these practices are, are impacting our nutrient loss dynamics. Because as we saw in some of the data I presented, you know, there's, there's just a lot of variability from, from year to year. So we need to be sure that that our results are going to be consistent across a range of conditions. Uh, and then again, moving forward, uh, we do hope to be able to run these types of studies 
uh, with uh, cover crops in cornfields, uh, really interested in looking at manure injection in both uh, grass and cornfields. Uh, manure injection is, is an exciting practice uh, because in addition to uh, keeping manure off the soil surface, um, there's different different types of uh, machinery that's going to inject that manure into the soil that uh, that may provide some ability to disrupt those macropores um, still within a no-till system um, that that can currently be be a challenge in, in again some of these soils. But so with that, uh, I'd like to say thank you to our funding sources, the Northern New York Ag Development Program, the NRCS, and the Basement Program, as well as. Uh, everyone who's been involved um, with this research uh, over the over the course of the years, a lot of a lot of field work, a lot of lab work um, is put into these. So thanks to everyone and the, and the farm crews that that helped make it possible. Uh, thank you, Laura. We have several questions. We they run long in our uh, our symposium time, but I think there's important questions here. Uh, being so close, is there a collaboration on water quality management with any of the Canadian research institutes? And the second question from the same person is, when he, was any of the land application of manure consisting of manure digestate from an anaerobic digester? Um, you know, I think there is some, uh, there is some collaboration, uh, certainly within Lake Champlain. Um, there is some collaboration between New York, Vermont, and uh, Quebec to sort of collectively address these issues since, uh, since we're all draining to the same watershed. And, um, you know, there's a, a lot of um, shared work among the, the researchers as well, you know, where we, uh, you know, collaborate um, as well as, you know, share, share ideas and, and meet up at the uh, conferences together. Um, none of the manure um, was from an anaerobic digester, um, all just um, sort of typical um, slurry stored uh, liquid dairy manure. Okay, uh, you mentioned that your ongoing research is going to address no-till, cover crop, etc. So there's a question about that. We'll be eager to learn more information in your future uh, results. Uh, there was a question that says for tile drainage, I guess, 25th of 0 0.001, what lab methodology are you using for one microgram per liter MDL or RDL? I'm not sure if that's how, it, hope you, did I read it right? Um, I did. I think I know what you're saying. So uh, the method we're using, uh, we're we're using a uh, um, word on a uh, injection uh, segmented auto analyzer, um, and we actually just updated our MDL, and we can get uh, as low as a 0.42 um, uh, microgram per liter detection limit on that. Okay. Uh, some stand by. Uh... Uh, would you characterize the 50th fertile representative of the base flow through the life system? That, that, that. Uh, could, I, could you just say that, let's see. I'm trying to read that sentence. The, well, let me, um, let me go to the next. For each of your annual field data sets, have you calculated the SRP slash TRP ratios for tile and surface runoff? Um. Uh, we have, I, I couldn't tell you that off the top of my head, um, you know, it, it does vary and sort of depending on, uh, you know, if, if a runoff event, if, if the losses were driven by, you know, like that one field where we saw um, a clear influence of the manure um, application, you know, we're going to see a higher um, ratio of SRP to total P. Um, if it's, you know, largely sort of just erosion related, it's going to be a lot lower. Um, so really, it could vary from year to year, but again, across across this entire data set, uh, we saw an average of fifty percent. I think you address the soil profiles that have the highest SRP. Uh, another question: do, do any of the fields have hicken bottom tubes, or do the fields have any open or blind inlets? Uh, no, they don't. No, these are all just um, subsurface drainage tile only. No, no surface inlets. Uh, uh, do you, can you elect, uh, describe the, the difference in water outflow? How does it affect stream banks? Or did you test for that? Or... Uh, we haven't looked at that. Um, that's something that, you know, I can't, uh, I can't really speak to that definitively. Um, you know, there is uh, obviously more 
uh, often more runoff coming from these tile drain fields, uh, but there is possibly an opportunity to reduce the peak flows that we're seeing because the surface runoff can deliver more water in a shorter period of time. Um, so uh, it's sort of a, you know, sort of a flattened curve. Um, so, you know, sort of like we've been thinking about with, you know, with COVID this past year where, um, you know, there was all talk of flattening the curve. And that's, that's sort of, uh, you know, possibly what we can see with tile drainage, where even if there's, you know, the same or possibly even a little bit more um, total lost during an event, the, the actual peak flow rate may be lower, um, which could, you know, have a, have a positive impact on, on reducing um, stream bank erosion. But um, our, our work definitely hasn't um, looked at that. And I think that's uh, definitely a, a, an area of research that, that needs more work done. Okay. Uh, how frozen were the fields during this runoff study? Uh, it varies the um, individual um, runoff event that I showed um, was not frozen at all. Um, so the tiles are about three feet deep um, and they were directly connected, you know, depending on the year, um, that, same, that same field uh, the year prior was frozen to a depth of probably four feet. And so we didn't see any tile flow until, you know, almost May. Um, so, you know, some years we, we get a, you know, a real hard frost to, to a pretty significant depth. Other years, uh, you know, we don't see any this year. I think because we've had um, a lot of snow cover mo throughout the, the cold periods, you know, as soon as we started seeing some snow melt, we, we did see tile flows increase. So, you know, I don't think the soils are, are all that frozen. So definitely uh, a lot of year to year variation. Um, I have a lot of more questions, but I'll try to pick the top three here. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, you mentioned, uh, I think briefly, the phosphorus, will the phosphorus saturate the soil so that the tiles might lose their efficacy? And if the, how does the soil concentration affect the efficacy, efficacy of the tile system to reduce peat? So it definitely, it depends on the soil. Um, different soils have uh, more ability to hold more phosphorus than others. Uh, but generally what we've seen for sort of the majority of our soils is that it's not really until those phosphorus levels get, um, you know, really high, well above, you know, what we would typically, um, you know, be recommending for, for the levels to be in the phosphorus, uh, the levels of phosphorus to be in the soils until we really start to see a, a big drop in the efficacy of that, of that filtration potential. Um, and, but that again is, you know, depending on um, what type of soil you have. Okay, uh, I had one note from John Hapman. He mentioned that in the, he, the units he uses for phosphorus in the lakes and streams is micrograms per liter. And he, you use milligrams per liter. So the reference would be 20 micrograms would equal 0.02 milligrams. Uh, yes, yes. For reference. Uh, Greg Raymond uh, says many of the farms in Cougar County use cover crops in addition to tile drainage. How much education, more education in phosphorus can be expected using both, well, well not re education, reduction in phosphorus can be expected with using both practices? Uh, you know, that's, uh, again, a good question. Um, a lot depends on sort of how, um, you know, how much growth you see of that cover crop. Um, you know, sometimes if a cover crop isn't getting planted, uh, you know, we, we've got some bad weather, a cover crop doesn't get planted until a bit later. We don't see a lot of, of growth um, from that cover crop in the fall. Um, but, you know, if, if we are seeing a nice robust cover crop um, grown that's going to stabilize the soil, reduce our erosion losses, it can also draw down that um, soluble phosphorus pool in the soil. Um, as far as a specific number, uh, you know, I can't really, I can't really give you that. Um, you know, it, it'll, it'll really depend on sort of a lot of different um, factors, but it, it does have the potential to, to help uh, significantly, especially, uh, especially with respect to erosion reductions. Oh yeah, definitely would help in the, the larger, larger percentage of the fields in our watershed are have cover crop. So uh, thank you, Laura, very much for this interesting information where we look forward to a follow up on your ongoing research. Great. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me to be here today. Thank you. So we'll